The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. Let's just say we hope all of our podcasts go like this year and they're so much better than last year's podcasts. And this year's better than last year. Mary. Always striving for improvement. I thought last year was pretty spectacular, but yeah, right. I'll take we it. can do better. Yes. We can do better. We can, we can always we can always strive for better. But if you were on last year's podcast, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with us. So. <laughs> we're still working out the kinks. We're well, we're, yes, every day, <laughs> of every second of my life. I'm being reprimanded. To me, his paintings, his paintings are so unique, and there's um, there's definitely a class of artists that you know paints beautifully and kind of paints what you expect. And he's in this class of artists that paints way outside of I know my expectations for what I am playing. You know, when I'm walking through a gallery, what I see, like you say, it's show stopping, it's scroll feeding, and whoa, what is that? Like that's that's the way, that's how he paints to me. Does anyone want to take a guess at what artist we're talking about? Welcome back to the Plenary Easton Podcast. I'm Tim Wagon with... Marie Nuttall. And we are talking with artist Lon Brower via Skype. Thanks for listening, everyone. We are here today with painter, um, plein air painter, plein air Eastern painter, artist Lon Brower. And uh, Lon, welcome to the plein air Eastern podcast. I'm very excited to talk to you uh, today because I absolutely, I don't know how long you've been coming here. We can get into your history a little bit, but I know your name. I know you have done extremely well here. And I have, and your, your name comes up from artists all the time that are here. And I have no idea who you are. So <laughs> I am. We need to change that. I, how does I, that we, make you feel, Lon? <laughs> it feels really, really good. But, you know, I can run in circles sometimes, you know. So, hey, it's great to, it's great to be on here. I, I've, I've listened to a bunch of your podcast. I've been working on a new studio space um, lately. And uh, so i, I got to have something going. I've been listening to all the podcasts. So I think I'm caught up. So, oh, good. Uh, and you guys have a lot of fun. You know, there's a lot of podcasts out there that are interesting but they're not fun, and you guys do a great job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Thanks, Lon. <laughs> we hope we can make this one fun for you. Yes. Um, so, uh, Lon, I'll just start out with this way. I think we want to get into your, your you know, how you became uh, where you are today in terms of uh, your painting and ever, anything else you wanted to talk about. But, like, the one thing that when I've been, haven't known who you were, and I'll be very honest with you, I've, I've seen – I don't know if it's your girlfriend or your partner or your wife that has been at the plein air. I've seen her every uh-huh. year, and I, I always thought she was an artist. I, I mean, I'm just – that's who I thought was an artist in, in, That's because I saw her every year. She is an artist. She's just not a can, can, canvas paint artist, right? Well, right, right. She's, yeah, yeah. So, so – well, that's interesting. Uh, so I need to carry, carry her with me all the time, it sounds like. So <laughs> well, no. It's just – she, <laughs> in, she well, carries herself like when she looks like – she looks like some people that I know around here that are artists. So I just kind of assumed that she was the artist. But the one thing I'll say is when I – I'm scrolling through Facebook, mm-hmm. and I see one of your posts, or I see one of your paintings, mm-hmm. particularly your paintings. I am stopped in my tracks through on the feed, and I'm like, "Who is that?" And I'm like, "There he is again, Lon Brower." I don't know who this guy is, but I love this painting, and I want to get into your style or whatever. Um, 
as we go because I know Marie has a couple questions here. But how how did you get going on this? How did how did this come about for you, Lon? And, and how did you you know how did you become a painter? Well, I, I you know like like so many people, I started out as a kid and I did a lot of drawing and painting and that sort of thing. But uh, you, my dad was a pharmacist and and I was the first born of four, so um, that was my that was my track. I was going to be a pharmacist and. Uh, I was good at chemistry, but I didn't understand it, and I was going to kill somebody if I ended up as a pharmacist somewhere. So, uh, but I always liked art and got into that. And went through uh, school at, here in St. Louis. Uh, I live in Granite City, which is across the river from St. Louis, and um, I went to Washington University and um, uh, you know got a degree in, in painting. And um, when I got out of school, I uh, needed a job desperately, and uh, I didn't really want to leave the area, so. Uh, I uh, landed a gig with a, um, uh, a studio photography, um, uh, a photography studio, and doing advertising and that sort of thing. And I ended up doing that for about 30 years, even though it was just going to be start out as a part time thing. But uh, you know, I, and things started changing uh, around 2000. You know, when things went uh, digital, um, and I first said I would never do that because I was shooting with I was shooting film, shooting with uh, large uh, uh, view cameras. Yeah. And um, uh, you know, and then I had one of my good clients call me and said, you know, we're doing a catalog. We got 700 shots and we want to, uh, and we want to do a digital. Can you do that? So I, I made some calls and there we are. So, um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to say, how did the digital, what, what, how did that come about? You, you digitally, well, we went, what were you doing digitally? Shooting pictures? Well, we went from yes, film to digital and it went, it happened, you know, and, and you well, hated digital. I didn't hate it. It's just that I was going to have to get a new computer. I was going to have to learn, you know, I was going to have to learn Photoshop. There was a lot of things I was going to have to learn, and I was thinking, I don't want to do that. Uh -huh. um, on the other hand, I ended up doing it, and it wasn't that bad. So, yeah, I'm I'm not a luddite, but I I do uh, drag my feet when it comes to technology. So, uh, but my business, the business changed because the needs of, of photographers changed. They, they, you know, clients didn't need it as much as they they did in, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they had people on staff, they could, and everything was web instead of uh, uh, print ads. So, um, uh, you know, on web, your, your images didn't have to be quite as good, and it was it was it was volume over over quality. And uh, anyway, I you know, and and budgets changed. So it was at that time I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a painter, which is what I really want to do, this is the time to to jump into it. So. Um, I got back into painting, and uh, I think it was around 2010, uh, a client of mine called and said, uh, there's an event, uh, something called plein air going on at one of the wineries just west of St. Louis. Would you go out there and take some shots? And I, So I went out there, and uh, there were people scattered all over the hillside. Uh, you know, Some were standing, some were sitting, some had dogs with them, some had their kids. Uh, there was watercolor, it was acrylic, it was all this stuff. And I didn't know people did that because I, and in fact, I didn't even know that, that there was a thing called plein air. Uh, when we painted outside, you know, my circles, we called it painting outside. <laughs> right. And, but uh, I thought, you know, I can do this. So in 2011, the following year, I signed up and, and it kind of took off from there. Um, wow. And, you know, and so, and at the, at the same time, I had been painting, uh, I, I'm a, I think of myself primarily as a figurative painter. Uh, but I paint everything and print and everything, uh, you know, all different kinds of subjects and all those subjects, um, uh, you know, I, I treat them kind of the same way. Uh, so um, uh, anyway, when I got into, uh, you know, I started seeing these plein air events and I, and I just realized that there were more and more of them all over the country. So that's when you, you know, you start doing some research and figure out how can I go to this one? How can I go to that one and uh, work my way up the ladder? So you were you were in a, you were going to paint in a studio, I guess, but you never you never even seen knew people that went outside and painted like that in, in groups. Is that what you're saying? I, yes, and I I really had no plan because the only experience really I had had was if you're painting, you're painting in studio. Then what do you do with that? Right. Well, now you got you know you, you build a portfolio. I started doing um, um, art fairs too at about the same time. So I was doing plein air events and trying to juggle that with with uh, art fairs. You know, just trying to find a way to uh, find customer base, you know, people who would buy paintings. And um, and that was a learning curve there, too, uh, you know, trying to figure out how do I get 
how do I get a brand? How do I build that? How do I build experience? How do I, and then how do I set myself apart? Uh, which, you know, when you come back to the plan air thing, I, you know, when I first started doing it, I was making paintings I thought were pretty good. Uh, but they looked like everybody else's paintings. And, uh, you know, I realized that if I'm going to set myself apart, you know, number one, I wasn't winning any awards and I wasn't making any sales. So I had really nothing to lose. I would get into the shows, but, um, you know, I had the opportunity. I thought that when you might as well just kind of, uh, throw caution to the wind and see what comes up. So, um, uh, you know, so that's when I started trying all a lot of different things, trying different materials, um, you know, in, you know, in 2012, 2013, sometimes, you know, I would go to shows and, and, you know, you have the gala and see a lot of yellow green paintings up on the walls. They're really nice, but, but they all look alike. You, know, you couldn't tell one artist from another. Now that's changed. Uh, you know, you go, now you go to an event and there's a lot more diversity, which I really think is a really good thing, but I want to be part of that, that avant-garde, if you will, you know, at least now my stuff is representational and it's, and it's, uh, uh, it's not that far outside the edge or outside the box. That, that to me, almost, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but that, to me, would seem to make it almost harder than to go outside the box, is, is to, to sort of complement the representational by going outside the box. That would seem to me be a harder touch to finesse. Uh, it, it is in a way because uh, uh, you have to take chances, and, um, but I think once you try that and once you do it, uh, you get you, you change your your visual experience uh, once you see things. Um, uh, let's say you take it you take a, a, a conventional uh, traditional painting or image, if you will, and then let's let's change all the colors uh, to uh, well let's just drop all the color out and let's paint it black and white because I did some black and white plein air and uh, you know everybody just kind of nobody understands that. Uh -huh. But no reason why you can't do that. Right. Uh, and then, you, you know, and then I start And one thing leads to another. Everything's cumulative. So you, um, uh, you know, you, you each, you, know, you take little steps and over time you get into a, a, a new place with, uh, with different materials. I, you know, I, I use roofing tar once in a while, you know, I'll pull that out. It's not really a good thing to carry a, a bucket of this with you when you're, uh, you know, when you're, you know, you're out on location and you have to <laughs> pack in somewhere. But if you're just pulling out of your car, you know, right? Sure. You, as long as it's just a weird material just to see if it works and see if it, it'll make the painting different. Because what I want to do, you know, my my goal always is I want to put paintings on the wall that number one I would put on my wall, but also uh, that. I want to get the, the, the you know the, the the viewers to look at them and say, hmm, I've never seen that before. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, and, and maybe they'll say, I don't like it, but at least they've never seen it before, and they stop or they come back. You know, exactly. That's, that that's explains a, my thing with Facebook. You yeah. Totally explain my whole thing with Facebook. That's what stops me every time. And so I mean, you know, for me, well, job well done. Any, I mean, that, that's really it. It happens all the time. It happens. It happened to me already. I think either. In the set at the, around the holidays, I was kind of going through my feed a little bit more than I typically do, and that, but it was you know just happened very recently. So that is uh, is working for you, Lon. That's 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 um, very good. So I and I uh, I think this is a really good segue because this is exactly what I yeah. wanted to learn a little bit more about. Um, so you won an award this year for um, a judge's choice award this right. year for your painting. And Dan Weiss said, um, talked about, um, he said that the tension between abstractive components and the narrative ones that doesn't resolve itself and that he really liked that. And you talk on your website about an emotional narrative. And I was just like, I had a eureka moment. I was like, this is like, you know, it's almost like Dan, you know, your website was talking through Dan, <laughs> through Dan's opinion of your painting. I'd forgotten what he had said about it, but that, yeah, it, but that, it, it, yeah, I remember. I, I know he, he was, he was very complimentary, and and and, it, I, and I thought, yeah, this guy gets it, um, and, and I, I was really appreciative of that because we don't, that doesn't always happen, right? Uh, you know, what I do is not for everybody. Um, you know, I think we wanted to talk about that painting, right, Marie? Didn't you want to ask about that painting exactly? Or is there a story behind that, uh, Dan uh, or Lon? <laughs> Dan, you asked me to call you Dan. I, just I didn't. You Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> you are hereby renamed Dan Brower. Dan Lauer. <laughs> Brower. <laughs> you, have a, I, you know what? I'm thinking right here while we've been talking, I think I can get a whole new body of work and I'm just going to call it Dan Brower. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you could be like Banksy, you know what I mean? Just go under yeah. incognito, <laughs> change your name, whatever. I know whatever. Lon Brower, but I don't know Dan Brower. <laughs> Who's <laughs> this? Bro. Boy, he's a lot better than Lon Brower. <laughs> <laughs> The, so, the, go ahead, yeah, you can still see the painting um, on on our website, and um, and name? you said that it's still available. What's is that the name true? Of it? Do you know what the name of it, it is? is still, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's called Solitary Man, and it won Judge's Choice Award this year. And so tell us how that painting came about, and then we'll talk about the emotional narrative and the abstraction. And I'm going to look at it while you're talking about it, Dan. So I can get a bunch of my questions ready. <laughs> okay, Tom. <laughs> We're all going by different names today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did I call him Dan again? <laughs> he called you Tom. Okay, good, perfect. Now, it's L O N. I got to keep it. <laughs> okay, so we stayed this last uh, this last summer. We stayed with a uh, a couple uh, near Whitman. I guess it's over by Whitman. Yes. I think that, and. Um, uh, he and when we first got there, you know, they were setting us up and they said, anything you need? And I said, well, and I was talking to Mark, the um, uh, the husband of the, of the couple. And I said, you know, uh, here's kind of what I have planned to do. And I do I like to do figurative stuff. And, you know, and they, they had this Waterman Award and I'd really like to do something. And I know you're a waterman. Um, maybe I'd like to do something with you. I don't know. And he said, hey, you want to go on the boat? And I said, I don't know what that means. So. <laughs> so we thought about it. He said, yeah, if you want to go on the boat any day this week, just let me know. So uh, I thought about it a little bit. And so I said, yeah, I think that would be interesting to do. And I so I, I approached him again. He said, yeah, let's go on Monday. He said, uh, I said, how many people are on the boat? And he said, just me. I said, OK. And I said, uh, so when do we leave? And you know, where are the logistics? He said, well, he said, I get up at 3.30 in the morning. Yeah, we'll I knew that was coming. <laughs> we'll be down at Tealman Island at 4, and we'll get on the boat, and we will be on the, on the water until 1 o'clock. Because they have a certain length of time they can be on the water, and then they have to get off. And uh, so we said, okay. Then Dwana came with me, too. The two of us went with, with him and, and, with, and all my gear, and I had a 30 – a painting's a 30 30. I think that's a 30 30 painting. So I, I thought, I'm going to take this big canvas and all my gear, and I'm going to go on this boat, and we're going to be out there all day long and just see what happens. I had no idea what he does. I really didn't. I knew that he was clamming, and uh, he's, he's collecting clams, uh, which he bags up, and then he takes them to his. Uh, 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 he supplies then uh, uh, the, the guys that go out for crabbing, and they use them for, for bait for crabbing. That, all, that I knew. But I had no idea what he did during the day. So I'm thinking I want to paint him doing whatever he does. Uh -huh. And I don't know what the lighting situation is going to be. I don't know if there's going to be, you know, sometimes they say, the, you know, the water, it could be windy. The, uh, the, the water could be choppy. Uh, you know, again, it's a lot of unknowns. But out we went. And it was dark. And um, we go out and we find his spot where he's going to fish. And it's one of those boats with a big conveyor on the side. You guys know this better than I do. Yeah, it's pretty, cool. it's pretty cool going out that early in the morning like that, isn't it, though, on, on the bay like that? It's very cool because, you know, we're driving out. It's dead dark, yeah. and he knows where he's going. And <laughs> it was interesting. I had to talk with uh, – I don't know if I talked with you, Marie, or with, with Jess. I think it was with Jess. I said – because I know there was a rule. We, we had to be in Talbot County, and uh, – uh, I said, if we're on the water, we're not in Talbot County. And she said, I think we can make this one work. So, um, so out we went, and uh, I set up. Well, of course, I couldn't do anything until the sun came up. But once the sun came up, uh, I set up and I started doing. And this boat is spinning around. And he drops the conveyor. He's bringing up clams on this little conveyor, and he and all he does is stand there all day long to pick these pick these clams. And uh, the good ones go in the bucket, and the ones the, the rest of them go off the end of the conveyor, and, and they just it just goes out like this. And of course, the, the engine's running all day long, so you have this rumble all the time. Right. And, uh, which is why, which I was I found out later was is why the watermen talk loud, is because they, they don't have any hearing anymore. Hearing left. Yeah, they they, they have <laughs> to talk loud. It's the only way they can hear anything. So, so anyway, I set up and I thought, okay, well, I did some sketches first. And, um, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to dig into this and see what happens. 
Um, by 8.30, I was seasick, real seasick. Oh, no. The boat, is, the boat is spinning around, and I'm thinking, I can't do this. So <laughs> I, laid, I laid down for an hour and a half, which was fine. And when I got up and got back. And there's back, no go-backs. No, there's You're no, out there. You're you can't be back. like, hey, can you just, like, drop me off over here? <laughs> you're not getting off. No. And, no, you're not once getting I, off. Once I laid down and I got some more water in me, I was fine after that. And But, but the biggest problem was um, he's not moving. He's not really doing much of anything. But the boat is moving. And, you know, with plein air, you always have the sun is moving. You know, it's a, you've got this the, – the sun is constantly moving, so the shadows are changing. This was compounded by the fact that the boat was was rotating so that your you know your your canvas is in sun and then it's not in sun and then it's in sun and then it's not in sun and the boat is moving side to side and everything is vibrating and things are hot you don't want to lean up against some things because you'll burn yourself and um, just because of the sun they're hot right. No, because of the engine. You've got, you know, oh, you, you, you know, that sort of thing. So, well, yeah, the sun, too, because the sun's coming down and it's hitting that stainless steel and that get, can get hot, too. Right. Um, it was all really, really interesting, though, uh, you know, and trying to pull that off and because, uh, uh, you know, and, it, and and I didn't know either. All the interesting stuff really happened at the end when he was cleaning up because then he wasn't just standing at this conveyor belt. It was basically like a factory job. He's just standing there all day long in one spot. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but at the end, when he got ready to clean up, now he's getting the hoses out and he's moving around and he's putting things away. And that, of course that happened very quickly, but um, that was the interesting stuff. It's one of those things that I'd really like to revisit. I, I, I think Yeah. Uh, there's because now I know where he, ha- I didn't want to get in his way. And, um, Tell me uh, how you how do you secure a thirty by thirty canvas on a boat on the water? Like I I can't imagine a tripod and, on flat ground and the paints and the you know solvents and all this stuff and just trying to keep it all straight. But adding the water component makes it. Like, I don't know if you've ever I don't know if you've ever seen my my rig, but I've got a uh, uh, I carry an old uh, camera tripod. It's a, a Bogan tripod, so it's pretty heavy and pretty pretty stable. Um, but as soon as you put a cam- big canvas on there, uh, basically you're making a sail. You're on a boat, so it's on a boat. That's all and, we ever hear around here from Al Bond, yeah. our exec- CEO and executive director. He's like, well, you're making a sail out of it now. <laughs> <laughs> you're making a sail. Best thing to do is pop holes in it, but that doesn't work. You know, that's right. Not- <laughs> right, right. That would really be so, out of the box. <laughs> it was really just hanging on to stuff and, and wedging things and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, you know, just keep everything. And, and I've been in situations, too, with big wind where you had – it was interesting. I was down in, uh, down in Florida last, last uh, spring, and I was painting Duana laying on the beach. I, I had this idea of her laying on a beach, beach um, uh, towel, uh, and the one day I had left to do it, they had it, it felt like 30 knot winds i mean the wind was blowing it was blowing so hard it was blowing sand against her and against me and 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 all my paints which i usually lay out on the ground got all covered completely with 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 sand dunes <laughs> uh, and uh, you know if i re- needed to reach something i had to hold on to the can i had to wedge myself against the canvas and against the easel and then try to reach it with my toe and, and drag it over so i could because i couldn't let go of anything wow. because i did everything took off and, was, and the boat wasn't quite that bad, but it was kind of like that because it would lurch every now and again. And then it, Does that bug you when that sort of things happen? I mean, do you get a little ticked off when, when the boat rocks and you're like, oh, you know, whatever, you know, that kind of thing? Tim, everything bugs me. <laughs> uh, when, when I'm outside, it's like it's the stupidest thing to go outside and paint uh, because there's just so many variables. I mean, you know, people talk about enjoying the outside. I enjoy the outside, but... Uh, when I'm painting, it's it's like it's 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 a battle, and and I just I mean I do enjoy it. Don't get no, me I get wrong. You. I get that's what I was asking about that, <laughs> at that battle at it, that moment when the, when you're like putting this yeah, painting on. I do, but it's like you know because we have all these little compromises that have to be made, and you think, okay, I got to figure out how to do this. I can't do it the way I would like to do it, so now I got to figure another way to do it. And I think that, and then be able to come to that conclusion, I think is really kind of a. Uh, I know it's kind of a, it's 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 kind of a, a a badge of you know doing this this sort of thing. I, I, and I think part of the reason why I wanted to paint on the boat was to put myself in that that kind of situation. What kinds of unknowns will happen? What kind of variables? 
and how can I get myself out of that mess? And um, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Talk about talk about emotional narrative. Like, what emotional narrative comes through in a painting like well, that on a boat? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you, if you take a look at this painting. I, I guess it's on our website. You should definitely take a look at it. It's, yeah. it's a really gorgeous. The one thing I notice is the, you know, the the column of the boat almost looks like it was like a could be a column on a house, and that that one. And, but the other one's not not really there. But there's one that's there. So, I, I, I and and then the look on his face. Um, and again, the way the, the the profile of the guy, you can tell there's some definitely some good figure uh, stuff in there for something that's being done in two hours, I guess, or however yeah. long it took. So oh, I was out there for eight hours. It was you no know, nine hours. So, right. uh, but, but here's the thing, you know, it's, it's, you know, all of us who do this and have done it for a long time, we, we rely on memory a lot. Uh, you know, we, you think that we go out and we set up in front of something and then we paint that thing and, and there it is, you know, we look at it, we paint it, we look at it, we paint it. We do, but we're also relying on a, all the paintings we've done in the past. And, uh, you know, for to, to do a figure doing something and make it believable, you, you got to know what a figure looks like. You've got to have. So, you know, and that that, you know, the the the, um, the fellow Mark, that doesn't really look like him. It's it's kind of like him, mm -hmm. but it wasn't meant to be a portrait of him. If, yeah. I wanted, well, if I really wanted to make it look like him, that'd be a little different game. Sure. Uh, I was really concerned about it. I just want to make it look like it's a human. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be right. It just has to be believable. Well, and, and I think that's that's what I enjoy so much about your painting, Lon, too, is a lot of it is suggestive. You know, like you're you're suggesting that there's, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can get from looking at it that it is a man, that it is a man working. But when you start adding in all the, you know, like you said, the outside elements and the mosquitoes and, you know, the heat in Easton or you know, starting to add in more difficult things, painting on boats, painting, you know, suspended from cables, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm the type of person that I would shy away from that, but you you definitely sound like you are in. You're in for whatever shows up. I think that's the adventure of it, for me anyway. Uh, you know, you know, the first adventure is, of course, you've got to take everything that you use in a studio and, and try to condense it down into a box and carry it with you out in the field. So, you, you know, you're going to be limited. And, you know, and that kind of plays back to my, my days of photography when I go on location, you know, you had to carry stuff with you. And, and you got, if you didn't have something, you forgot something, which I invariably did. Uh, how do you, how do you make do? Uh, you had to MacGyver it. Yes. How do you MacGyver it? Is it exactly, <laughs> I've done that too. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I've, and it even happens in painting you know, where, um, I don't have something that that I have to you know I have to make do. And with painting, it's a lot easier because particularly the way I paint, if I have to paint the whole thing with a stick, I can do that because I can find a stick, and um, you know make it work. So uh, yeah, I really kind of I kind of enjoy that. I had a I was in uh, Texas several years ago, and um, it's in October, and that's just as they're picking all the cotton down there, all the cotton fields, and some of the cotton fields are still full. Well, a cotton plant is only about knee high. Right. And so if you paint a cotton field, it looks like it's been snowed on. Well, that's interesting, I suppose, but you see so many of those. And I thought, you know what I want to do? I want to see one of these cotton plants. And I want to see what it looks like from a worm's eye view. So what I did was I set my easel up and set my panel down low to the right on the ground. And then I laid down on the ground. It's dry in Texas. You can do that. And laid right down on the ground so that my head is actually on the ground so I can look up up to this this um, uh, this cotton plant which made it monumental and then in the background behind that then you had the field so it was just an idea of how can I show cotton plant and cotton field in a different way I thought it was fun it was interesting somebody one of the other artists said well, you know you could have you put a mirror down by your foot and I said yeah I know but laying down in the dirt makes a better story a whole <laughs> right yeah right sure uh, you know and, and I is that, you know, is that part of my branding? I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. Uh, you know, I've got paint all over my pants and, and uh, you know, I, I, I love to be able to get just feel like I'm digging into it mm -hmm. and, uh, and see what happens. Well, and I think that comes through, too. And, and, and Don, Lon, um, about this branding, you keep uh, you've mentioned a couple of times. You have some yeah. ideas on that? Uh, I think, you know, I think 
for me anyway. And I, and I, you know, I talked about a, a little bit about um, uh, doing art fairs. It was the same kind of situation. You need to set yourself apart some way. Uh, at least I feel I do anyway. I want to, I want to, I want people to go in and say, okay. And, and when they, when they see my stuff, they, they say, oh, that's, maybe they don't know who it is, but at least they know it's different from all the others. And um, that is not only uh, style and uh, materials, but, you know, there's also, uh, you know, when people buy paintings, they're not just buying paintings, they're also buying the artists as well. And I think uh, so tied to that is, is your reputation and your, your personality and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's just the, it's that whole package. And I think it happens as you go along, particularly if you're, you know, if you're working the, you know, working the circuit, uh, you, it's going to happen anyway. Some people are known as quiet folks. Some people are a little more uh, out, outside the box, and, and people, uh, some are very traditional. You know, everybody kind of has a, a, um, um, well, a brand, I guess. Uh, you know, you, you kind of know. You know, some uh, if you mention a name, somebody who's been painting out there quite a bit, you usually know what kind of work they do. And you kind of have a sense of them and, and what you, you know, what kind of hat they wear and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So, um, I, I just think, you know, it's just part of it. Well, that's true for you too, because definitely when you say his name correctly, Lon Brower. Yeah, I'm gonna try and hit it right. The there are definitely the images that come to Lon's painting. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely for sure. Um, Marie, what was the other thing you wanted to hit on here? Um, we talked about uh, oh the choreography of a painting. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is that? What I've never heard. I've never heard that before. Well, you know, when I first started doing this, uh, I did like so many. I'd get in the car and I'd drive around until I saw something I wanted to paint, and I'd stop, get everything out, paint it, and put it back in the car, and then go back to the next one. And uh, as as I've gotten along, particularly in the last year and a half or last two years, I suppose last two seasons. Um, I wanted to think about, I used to do quantity over quality. Well, I don't know if it was quantity over quality, but it was quantity for sure. The first time I did Door County, I did 21 paintings. Uh, oh. It was just cranking them out, uh, you know, because I paint fast anyway, but crank, 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 crank. Now, some of them were good. Some of them were not so good. Some of them were, were really good. But uh, uh, as I go along, I'm thinking, I want to spend a little bit more time figuring out what I want to do and how I want to do it, really thinking about, uh, what is it I'm trying to say? I'm just not making product, but I really want to have a little bit more control on that, um, which means I still do about 14 paintings and I still work fast, but uh, it's just a different approach in how I, I handle it. Um, uh, for instance, well, this time I had already kind of conceived, I had no idea what I was going to find on that boat, but I kind of had an idea of there was going to be a guy in a boat somewhere. And uh, a couple years ago, two, three years ago, I had, uh, there's a, there's an old Victorian house down in Tillman Island. And I wanted to paint that because at about 5, 30, 6 o'clock, the sun goes down behind the trees and it, and it casts a shadow. So the top half of that house is, it's white house and the top half of that house is, is white and the bottom half is, is in purple shadow. And I really wanted to paint that house. And then I thought, you know what, it needs something else. And it needs maybe, I don't know, an old car. And I thought, where am I going to get an old car? Well, if you go back up to, I don't know if it was in Oxford or St. Michael. I, think I don't it was think you have to go far to find an old car around here. <laughs> no, there, there was a museum, and I don't know if it's still there or not, that had an old car museum. And I think yeah. it's, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's about two miles up the road. So I went up there, and I thought, well, maybe they'll have a Model A or a Model T. Yes, they did. It was inside. And I thought, well, okay, I'm not, I don't really want to do that. But they had this, I don't know, it was a 1947 Dodge Hyperglide or something like that that just brought in as blue, and it was sitting out in front of the museum. I thought, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to paint that house, and I'm going to put this blue car in front of that house. So I've got to paint the house in Tillman, and i got to go back up to St. Michael's and paint this car onto the same canvas. And then I'm thinking, it's not about the house now. It's about the car because I was painting cars at the time <laughs> blue. So I'm gonna go paint the blue car, and now I'm gonna put the house behind it. So I gotta go. So anyway, I was going back and forth between these two locations at different times of day, but trying to see if I can meld them together. Is that plein air? Yeah, they're both outside. Right. But it's taking elements from one side, so in one place, and, and and elements from another place, and putting them together, and making something that really doesn't doesn't 
doesn't really exist, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But it does. Both they do exist somewhere. Uh, Just not next to each other. And that and that's the fun of it. I don't know where it's going to go. And uh, there's some things that I paint that are just weird um, that nobody's ever going to buy. But um, uh, I just want to see. I just want to see what I'm going to do with it. You that's, still you yeah, still love that's... it so much, Lon? Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. I, you know, I paint because it's it's one of those things I know how to do. Uh, finally, uh, it, it, like a couple of years ago, it just it kind of dawned on me. Oh, a child could do this. You know, if you if you do enough of it, and some it, it starts clicking. And then once you know um, how the materials work and how the tools work, and then uh, that's when you start saying, okay, now what am I going to do with this? And, uh, uh, you know, during COVID, I, you know, of course, nobody went anywhere. I would just go to my studio, which is in my garage, and every morning I'd get a cup of coffee and go over there, and I'd just throw some paint for an hour. Sometimes it'd be all day. Sometimes it'd just be for an hour. Just just something. And... Um, it was delightful in a way. I didn't make any money that year, but uh, but it was delightful as far as just getting in the studio and just doing things that didn't really matter. And I'm trying to take that approach too when I do plein air. You know, we, we get there and it is a competition. And yes, you want to make sales and you you know hopefully win awards if you know if that can happen. Uh, but at the same time, you need to keep I think uh, uh, an openness so that experiments can happen and and some you know fun things can happen. And it's not just a job. Um, and, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, it works for me. So. Yeah, it sounds like you got a good job. Do you paint every single day, Lon? Just about. Just about. Uh, there are times when I'll get uh, worn out, and I and I realize, and I know it, and I'm just kind of pushing stuff, and, and I'll take a few days off. But, uh, uh, you know, I'll wake up in the morning, and I think, i got to get out there and try something. And yeah. Just, and, and, and if, if it's not, if I get stuck, which I don't, not really get stuck then i'll go i'll do some exercises i'll just paint a bunch of cubes or you know i do something right. and that often then will lead to the next thing which leads to the next thing um yeah it's what i do do you have kids on i do they're all so grown could you be a, when you first you, you say i try to paint every day mm -hmm. when you when you're if you're juggling like uh you know the kids back in the day did, could you paint every day then no no see when i was doing uh, when they, my kids are growing up, uh, I, I was, that's when I was doing all the photography and I was spending a lot of hours in studio and had a lot of, a lot of 12, 14 hour days. Uh, I had my own studio and, um, uh, there was no time for painting. Now I, I did work with a, a medical supply company, uh, which for about 10 years and I, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, you know, they had, uh, syringes and needles and bandages and urine bags and, and, and chest drainage and all this kind of stuff. So all that had to be photographed, and it, it is what it is. Um, but I had an opportunity to, the, the art director was really good about letting me do illustrations for the backgrounds. You know, how do you show tubing in some interesting way? Well, you put, you know, you put a, some sort of an, anatomical drawing underneath it. So that kind of kept, kept a hand in it. But as oh, far cool. as, I just really... I just really didn't do it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when I was painting again, I had to—I really had to learn the language all over again. Well, I think that's a good place here. I, I, when you talked about, you know, you could teach a child to do this type of work. You know, you always see I on. Say, well, you, you could teach a not child this type could of work. Do a it. child could do it. Yes, I, it just got me thinking. Were there any? Uh, you know, you always see on sixty minutes the child prodigy piano player, the child prodigy violin player segments or whatever do we have a child you know painter or whatever that's a prodigy it's kind of got me going on that idea um marie i think that we're going to uh get ready to wrap this up you have anything else for Lon? i have rapid fire questions go ahead rapid fire here we go rapid fire one uh, two three rapid <laughs> fire <laughs> um lawn movies or live broadway shows oh golly uh movies Movies, dawn or dusk? Oh, golly, uh, dawn. Uh, favorite city in the world besides the one that you live in? And this is not, I'm not baiting you, so don't <laughs> say Easton yeah. if you don't feel like the you like it. The big city of Easton is my favorite city <laughs> in the world. Yes, Easton is my favorite. Um, <laughs> what a city. Um, <laughs> um, um, cities I've been to, uh, 
golly, I don't know. Um, I'm not crazy about cities. I like smaller towns. Ward, okay. Colorado, Ward, Colorado. Tiny little, tiny little town. A friend lives there. Uh, it's the middle of nowhere. Maybe it'll become a city now. We maybe we put, on, we put on a planner maybe. podcast. No, maybe we're right. start moving to Ward. So. We might go interview some residents of Ward, Colorado. Sure, rabbit fire. Um, tell uh, what uh, favorite? Uh, are you a candy eater? <laughs> that was slow fire. Oh, sorry. <laughs> But if I did, uh, Werther's. I like Werther's. You know, the, the, the candy. What about Reese's? Reese's? Reese's peanut butter cups. No, I don't like peanut No, I don't like Reese's. Oh, there my. Go. We, we, what about we're retro? Cut that out. What about retro candy? Like a candy that takes you back to your childhood. Whorehound. Whorehound drops. Do you know Whorehound drops? Oh, my drops? gosh. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. And so. at, at the drugstore, Whorehound drops. <laughs> climb a mountain or jump from a plane? Oh, well, I'll climb a mountain any day. Nice. Easy one. Easy one. <laughs> um, all right. And the last one, a country you'd be okay never visiting in your life. Ooh. Oh. No. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Bulgaria. I don't know. <laughs> now, now I'm Sorry, I'm, all of all Bulgarian friends. I don't know. You're trending in Bulgaria. Yeah. Lon, <laughs> thank you very much. This is a great conversation. It's great to get to know you. Great to get to meet you. I mean, that is one thing too we found out with some of these podcasts is that a lot of these people and you you know, you've been doing it a long time and you're successful at it and, and you know, your name comes up a lot, but uh, regardless of whether I could say it or not. Um but you, you know, getting to know people through this process of these podcasts has been really cool for us and I think for some of the artists as well who are listening because you don't really get to time to really sit down and chat with truly and, that's my favorite part and well we really don't you know we get we when we get you know we hit the ground running and and uh, you know we often talk about how we like to do these plan so we can get together with our friends we see them at the beginning we see them at the end we don't see them during the week right the reason, you know <laughs> we just don't because you're busy 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 and um, but uh, yeah i think all the different kinds of people that i've, I've met you know you guys and and uh, uh, you know the different artists and and, uh, and collectors as well, and and uh, we, we become this 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 extended family, which is really 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 fun. Lon, do you do any um, teaching or workshops or anything, or is that I, not your bag? Uh, you know, I'm I'm really starting to do more workshops. Uh, I I sort of shied away from it for a long time because I felt like I ju just didn't know enough, and uh, which is not true, I know, but uh, exactly. trying. To Trying to figure out how do I talk to how do I get how do I get it across to people? I, I taught um, community college for a while, and I just loved that. Uh, and I'd get these kids that were there for a reason. They were there, you know, they really wanted to learn. I was, it was figure drawing and, and just drawing. And um, uh, yeah, it's 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 a it, teaching's a cool thing. It's but how do you get someone to understand? How do you get someone to perceive? Uh, you know, everybody sees the same, but how do they perceive and how do you get them to, you know, how do you get the light bulb to go off? And, and so they understand that, you know, just looking at something and then drawing it is, that it, it sounds easy, but that's not what it's all about. It's, it's this, you know, we, we, we have to conjure all this stuff in our heads and then we have to then translate it back out onto a surface. That's, that's a complex thing. And uh, once once you make that connection with a student, then they they just take off, and you, know, you, you can tell when it happens. It's amazing. There's light, there's music, and everything. So, uh, to answer your question. I'm trying to do more workshops uh, uh, because I think uh, I always learn something from it, and, uh, and and people who take my workshops seem to enjoy it. So, yes, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And beat that. Yeah. Lon, it has been great talking with you. Well, um, I. I I appreciate it. It's been fun. And I'm sorry for messing up your name. That's all right. Because I did it several times. And the well, only thing, no. I've, I've been thinking, like, why? In your defense, whole... Tim, you, you literally came into the session. You're like, I wanted to know, I want to learn more about Lon Brower. I had his name right the first time. <laughs> the yeah, best, out I of think, the gate he did. I think there was a baseball player. I think he played second base, and his name was either Don Bauer <laughs> or he played for the Brewers or something like that. It's the best thing I can figure. That's very possible. Very possible. Thank you, Lon, very much. And we look forward to seeing you stay safe and take care and good luck with everything. And we look forward to seeing you po probably this year. You're coming back. You're an award winner. So I got, I, I, I got my stuff. Uh, everything's been uh, applied to, so we'll just see what happens. Keep I saw. Fingers. Yay. Check yay. out Lon Brower stuff. You will not be disappointed. Thanks for listening, everyone. This is the Eastern Podcast. 
The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by Poddington Bear. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plein Air Easton at plenairesteen.com.